the Sam Hills going on here? The Rewatch Podcast presents the Lois and Clark Rewatch. Dedicated to the series Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman on ABC. Join us each week as we investigate the origins of the Man of Steel and uncover crime in Metropolis. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast or follow us on Twitter at rewatchpod. Oh, hey, 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 let's get back to it. And welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast and our Lois and Clark Rewatch. I'm Corey. And I'm Lex's eyebrows. <laughs> well, you're not here. No, I'm not here. It's just weird. <laughs> it's just strange. It's a little odd. I know what they're going for, but still, I'm like, uh, something's <laughs> creepy about him. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Rewatch Podcast. And this week's headline reads, Phoenix Copy. And we're discussing the Phoenix and top copy now before we get into it a quick follow-up all right so from uh, the zoomway forums we had uh, bev k over there and she mentioned on the forums um this is going back to the uh, season's greetings episode where uh, martha comes and she grabs clark by the ear you know and she's upset mm-hmm. because he just used his superpowers to to get rid of lois's uh heel to mess up her heel she grabs his ear and pulls him along and clark is like ah ow ah you know yeah and she said she said i don't know you know what it says about her but she says i i noticed too many little things like this and i found out that kryptonians must have another weakness it's their ears <laughs> he grabbed their ears <laughs> and they feel pain <laughs> So I was like, you know, what? I actually did notice that when we when we were talking about the episode, I was like, oh yeah, that when I was I was going through you know stuff to write down, I remember that, but I, for some reason I didn't write it down. We started talking about other stuff or or whatever. So yeah, she she mentioned that, and I was like, oh yeah, that's that's pretty good. I kind of thought that maybe you know he was just kind of reacting on instinct because he's acting like a kid because of the spray right you know as a kid he would like naturally be like oh, i don't want to get pulled by you you know that's mean ow you know like that type of thing that's what i was thinking that he was doing well and at the same time is it really a weakness i mean you got to be able to sneak up on him <laughs> get him by the ear assume that right. he's not going to like push you away or anything right <laughs> <laughs> well i reactions uh, chimed in with a theory and what he said was he's he's not an expert on human physiology but he said just because superman's invulnerable doesn't mean he doesn't feel sensation you know he eats he drinks with relish he, he loves it he you know he can love sugar he experiences tiredness so he he does feel pain he's invulnerable to it but he does feel pain so even though she's grabbing his ear and it's not going to hurt him he can feel the pain of what it's doing mm. and i like that theory i think that's 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 pretty good he's he's invulnerable but he still feels the pain yeah so when she, <laughs> yeah so when she grabs his ear yeah it's not going to hurt him but he feels the the pulling on his ear so he <laughs> it, it, he feels that pain yeah i like that theory i think that's good i dig it good catch bev k always great to hear from you yep all right well let's get into our first episode discussion today and the episode is The Phoenix, surprisingly written by Tony Blake and Paul Jackson. <laughs> They're very inconsistent. I was right? shocked <laughs> when I saw they wrote it. Shocked to discover. <laughs> Directed by Philip Scrigsia. Yeah, I'm, I'm never going to get that right. <laughs> nope. And this originally aired on February 12th of 1995. Look. If you are with Intergang... What's Intergang? A new crime organization in Metropolis. Just a group of thugs. All substance and no style. Didn't take long for the jackals to move in. Look. Look, whoever you are, I want you to know right now you can't be. Oh, yes, I can. Hex? Lothar. Your worst nightmare. A billion dollars, Mr. Bender. Where is it? It's all, it's all tied up in real estate. I, I can get you a few thousand uh, now, but... Sorry. But... Wrong answer. Oh, 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 I, 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 I don't know people in Intergang. Uh, maybe I can talk them into bringing you in. Sorry, Mr. Bender. Wrong answer again. Oh, oh, ah, 
Oh, look. Oh. Gretchen, the rats have a voracious appetite tonight. Oh. But will they eat one of their Stop. own? Please, please. I'll, I'll, I'll get a bag for you, I promise. Bon appetit. Oh. I know who has it. How do you know about kryptonite? Look, I know someone. I can get it for you. If you cross me, Bender, I will cut open your chest and sew up a rat inside. Within the Metropolis sewers, we find Dr. Gretchen Kelly once again trying to restore Lex Luthor to life, but this time she's aided by an accomplice, a one Nigel St. John. Just as things seem to turn with Lex's heartbeat flatlining, he bursts out of his glass and metal chrysalis, reborn. Meanwhile, Clark goes ahead and does what he should have done a long time ago and asks Lois for a date, and after some hemming and hawing, she accepts and plans are made. A photo is sent to Clark from a friend at the FBI that shows Gretchen and Nigel together, and using his supervision, sees the two passing the name Sheldon Bender on a napkin. Lex, having lost his assets stolen by his old lawyer, Bender, and then invested with Inner Gang, persuades Bender to aid him, and they end up pulling strings to get Rolly Vale, the smarter half of the Metallo creators that got away with Kryptonite, another hearing. Among the pulled strings is a bomb that Lex plants undercover under Perry's chair, resulting in Superman coming to save him, eventually being revealed just as a diversion while Lex and company steal parts from the bomb squad headquarters. Lex goes further undercover as an old man and shows up near Lois Lane and chats several times with her before revealing his true identity, hoping to once again win her heart. She quickly rebuffs him and Lex's love quickly turns sour, becoming the age-old adage of, she will be mine. Oh yes, she will be mine. Perry decides that the best way to find Luther is for Lois and Clark to go on a stakeout, canceling their date, and see if Bender slips up and reveals anything. They end up following a lead, which leads them to the plan to break Vale out of prison on the way to the hearing. Clark leaves to, quote, call the police, and Lois is kidnapped by Gretchen and brought to Lex. Lois finds herself in the sewers with Lex, talking with Vale and securing the kryptonite, which he plans to use to kill Superman when he comes to rescue her. Vale asks for his money, part of the deal that they had, but Lex pulls a double cross and orders Nigel to kill him. Unfortunately, Nigel has decided that instead he will take the kryptonite, no longer satisfied playing Lex's underling. A struggle ensues and Lex is shot while Nigel escapes. Gretchen, trying to help Lex, pushes Lois into a hole full of rats, causing Lex to become enraged when Gretchen won't help him rescue her and pushes her into some old wiring, electrocuting her while Superman appears, saves Lois, stops Lex from trying to commit suicide once again, and puts him away in prison for good. Do you know the story of the phoenix? Yes. Sacred bird reborn, rising from its own ashes. That's right. When I was a little boy, my mother told me that story. And I, I always liked the park where he from the dead. It's good to see you again, Lois. Did you think I wouldn't come back for you? Yes, look at me. I've lost everything. My fortune, my reputation. Everything but my feeling for you. We must take the miracle of my resurrection as a sign. As a sign that even death can't keep us apart. How is this? No. Question a miracle, we're together again. That's all that matters. What? What? No. No, I could never. When I've fallen from grace, haven't I? I can see it in your eyes. But surely a creature of such abundant benevolence would allow me the chance to redeem myself. I, I don't have those feelings for you anymore. I don't believe you. How could you expect? After everything you've done, well, yes, I did terrible things, but I did them for you. I was provoked by the blinding light of your beauty. But if you can't forgive me, then here. Call the police. Go ahead, call. You do feel something for me. 
No. I just feel maybe you've suffered enough. All right, so let's get into the investigation. All right, so there was supposed to be a cut line where uh, someone says something to Bender about where he got the kryptonite and... And uh, he says, Mrs. Cox told him. So there was a, a call back to her. So they just got right. rid of that line altogether, <laughs> which is fine because we don't really care. <laughs> the Luther disguise that he was supposed to be in was described as an old gray-haired man. So, like, he wasn't supposed to be recognizable. But the makeup job that they used on him, it was not that gray. <laughs> like, you could tell it was him. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like uh, Back to the Future 2 where Doc takes yes. off all that prosthetics and he looks <laughs> yes. exactly the same. I know. I was thinking the same thing. It's like, that's not like, like he's tearing off his skin. And I'm like, nothing looks different about you. <laughs> you still look exactly the same. It's like, could have add, add some more wrinkles or something to make you look different. But, yeah, it was... That was an odd scene right there. Jimmy uh, notices that uh, Lois and Clark are going to go on a date, and so he's talking with Clark about Pearl Jam. And I'm not sure if Clark was not really familiar with Pearl Jam, but Jimmy was like, oh, yeah, that you're going to have a great time. There's going to be a mosh pit. Everyone's going to be jammed together. You can barely see or breathe. And Clark replies, I never felt old until this minute. <laughs> a little, little comedy there. When Lois tells Lex he's suffered enough, that, that whole scene there, Gretchen was supposed to be watching from nearby and she was supposed to like be visibly angry you know like because she's of course she's in love with Lex and hearing someone put him down like that she's just uh, she gets you know it makes off. sense that they left it until later yeah for her yeah. to sort of figure that he's like still swooning over Lois going along with that Lex you know Lex complimented Nigel when he got rid of Bender and there's supposed to be a line there where Gretchen says well it's too bad he couldn't get rid of two nosy reporters as well and then Lex responds by saying you mean one and then Gretchen replies, oh, of course, I, I mean one, you know. So just they they were planting the seeds for that uh, a little bit earlier. Gretchen shouts when Lex gets shot with the, uh, was it the dart? She says, I'll take care of you, Lex. And she expresses her love to him. And he was supposed to say, well, I'm touched, but you know what they say. The best laid plans. And that's when uh, Lois says, looks like you got the kiss off to Gretchen. And that's when Gretchen gets really enraged and, you know, pushes her into the pile of rats and then her death scene was supposed to be seen. It wasn't supposed to be off screen. They were supposed to show her actually like getting electrocuted instead of just okay. being off off camera. So that I mean that's okay, but it's kind of like it's a little cheesy, you know. Especially mm -hmm. Lois's line, you know. It's like looks like you just got the kiss off. Dun, dun, you know? Dun. <laughs> I know it's so it's so cheesy. So they got rid of that. And then uh, finally, there's a scene with uh, Jimmy and Perry, and Jimmy asks, you know, do. You, you know, what do you think of the two of them dating? You think this is good? And Perry just, it, it's like a nothing line, really. He just says, you know, I, I withhold judgment, but I, I hope it works out. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of whatever. <laughs> I'm glad you approve, Perry. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's all right. <laughs> it's not like, this, it's a weird, weird line. Like, yeah. Especially for Lane Smith. Like, they, you think they would come up with something better. I hope it works out better than it did for Elvis and Priscilla. <laughs> Something exactly. like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was just, but it was so plain. It was like, what the heck? That's, that's weird. It's a weird line. Oh, Tony Blake, Paul Jackson. <laughs> so good and sometimes so bad. Lois, when will you ever learn? I always get my way. Lex, please, before you make things worse. I've already been through the worst. All right, Vale. Where did you hide the kryptonite? It's been right here all along. My Excalibur. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to kill Superman when he comes to rescue you. And then there'll be no one to take you away from me. Nigel, keep this in a safe place. Now, where's my money? Oh, yes, Nigel, pay the man. Hey, what's this? It's called an old-fashioned double-cross. Exactly. Won't you join me, Rami? At two, Nigel? Nigel, what are you doing? You've had your day, Lex. Now it's intergang with the deep pockets. But we're a team. 
When the lead wolf is weakened, the pack quickly turns. If the deal was my freedom and the money... No! Oh. Let's go, Ramin. Is he all right? I'll take care of him. It's all right, my love. It's just a minor setback. Stay away! Oh. Oh. Lex! Lex, she doesn't love you. Oh, she hands. never loved you. Give me your hand. She sacrificed everything to free you. Oh. I love you. I'll kill you. Okay, well, let's get into the main story. And our lead here, Lex Luthor lives. Dun, dun, dun. Lex is resurrected by Gretchen. And our old friend Nigel is back. Asabi's still not around. <laughs> no, where is Asabi? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're finally getting back to it, this resurrection. Yeah. So they don't really explain too much about how Gretchen managed to do this. I mean, the fact that he was alive in the first place when she had him, but then... You know, the pod was taken offline and everything. She just kidnapped him back and right. has now brought him to life again for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really know the science behind this, right? Right. There's no, yeah, there's no science behind it. If there was, we'd be like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it doesn't work. So it's better they left it unexplained. But man, oh, it is so good having John Shea back on the screen, isn't it? Yeah, it does. Like the whole like episode for me, I was just like, it was just elevated above everything else we've seen in, in season uh, in season two so far. It's the best moment as he comes out and Nigel goes, "I don't believe it," and he just stares down the camera and goes, "Believe it." I know. It chills. <laughs> like, oh, it chills. oh, that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really good. But, uh, you know, we've kind of got, like, this intertwined thing here with Clark finally getting around to asking out Lois. You know, it confused me because I was watching the episode and we had that whole Lex reveal and then we cut to, like, Lois and Clark in the middle of a of a date and it was so realistic and normal. I was like, wait, did I skip an episode or something? Yeah. <laughs> what, did I, what did I miss? Like, I had no idea. I didn't realize it was a daydream. You know, like, it, it took me a little bit. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I actually stopped the episode and went back to, like, the main list of episodes and was like, did I miss something here? Yeah, it was, I thought it was a good way to sort of bring it in, to sort of give you that sort of, like, what? Hang on, wait. <laughs> They're doing what now? <laughs> what? Exactly. What did I miss? But, of course, Clark's just, like, the worst timing in the world, of course. <laughs> Lex uh, is coming uh, back and now he asks out Lois. Ugh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but she doesn't answer straight away, and they're interrupted because they get a letter from the FBI <laughs> with information on Gretchen and Nigel. Yes. And a quick zoom and enhance <laughs> on this picture leads them to this guy, Sheldon Bender. And um, I, <laughs> I thought it was a great line where he's just like, oh, maybe we should talk to Sheldon Bender. And Jimmy's just like, what? Why? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know. He was Lex's lawyer. We should talk to him, right? <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> this is where it really kicks off. Like, they know something's going on because they're going to go and see uh, Sheldon Bender. And he is kidnapped, pretty much. Like, right in front right. of them. And it's Lex's goal to try and get kryptonite. Like, he knows that all of his accounts have been cleared out, that Bender has funneled everything off. He says that he's invested it in property or something. Right, real estate. Which was kind of funny, because that's, that's like a, a callback to uh, the Superman movies, where Lex Luthor is all about real estate. Even the Superman Returns one, it's like, all about real estate, owning this property here. And... What he really wants is kryptonite. He figures that if he can get kryptonite, then he'll be fine. Because because he needs to take out Superman. Like, that's his right. ultimate goal. Like, he doesn't really care about anything else. Is it true to the character that he wouldn't care about his money and all that? Like, did it work for you? I think, I think it worked for me, you know? He's kind of shed of all this material stuff. And he says to Nigel, like, no need to call me sir anymore, you know? We're back on the street together and it's going to be a dogfight. Yeah, it was kind of neat to see him without all that stuff. 
You know, he was like dressed. You know, usually he's we see him in like in a suit, you know, or extravagant like you know satin robes and things like that. But now he's like dressed like a, a street fighter, like he said. You know, we're just trying to trying to get through this best we can. It was kind of neat. There's a like, neat change for the character, and he still just since Superman was the one that brought him down, he's just obsessed with that. You know, sure money would be good, but you know he's very resourceful. He always has a plan, so it's kind of I, I like the way they did it, and it's a great tie in as well. The fact that he starts losing his hair. Yeah, that's good. It's just, I know what they were going for. You know, like they wanted to medically explain, you know, why he didn't have his hair. And of course, if he's going to lose his hair, you know, it's going to affect his eyebrows too. But it just looked very odd to not have the eyebrows there. Because even in the comics, he has his eyebrows, even though he doesn't have his hair. And I, I can't remember exactly why in the comics, what the reason was, because it's I think it's changed you know, several times. I know at least one time after uh, Superman had died and and, uh, Lex had faked his own death and come back as a son, he lost his hair uh, and, but, like the eyebrows were still there they came back as I, I, they didn't he didn't lose the eyebrows basically and i don't know i can't remember why it was something to do with kryptonite poisoning or something if i remember correctly i don't know it was just weird it was uh, he looked weird without the eyebrows and i'm surprised like nothing came up in the investigation about whether or not john shea actually shaved his head for this because i couldn't tell i thought mm. he either really did shave his head or that was just a really good bald cap they stuck on him because it looked real enough to me yeah i think it was uh a bald bald cap there was a actually let me look here when i was reading the uh the reviews of it over at the uh, superman homepage, actually they did mention that it is just a bald cap because there was one scene at least if you look carefully you can see the edges of the bald cap so yeah, yeah. he didn't apparently shave his head it was just a, a very good bald cap except for that one scene he said where you can sort of tell it's a that it's a bald cap well it would say that's the only actual like good prosthetic <laughs> yeah <laughs> As we get into it later on, you know. But, yeah. uh, you know, we do get some continuity here amongst episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a couple of returning characters. Lois and Clark, while sort of investigating all this stuff, go to see Bobby Big Mouth. <laughs> <laughs> who I thought was a bit of a highlight from that old Gang of Mine episode. Yes. <laughs> I remember, like, now that we're watching these all, I remember the character. And I, for some reason, I thought he was in these episodes a lot more than he was. Because I remember him being around a lot. But apparently, that's just my faulty memory. And then uh, Bender takes... Uh, Lex and Nigel to see Rolly Vale, sort of tying up that loose end from the Metallo episode. Right. When they uh, started the episode, there's a line where Perry uh, yells out to another reporter. He says, when am I going to get that story on the Vale uh, capture? You know, and I was like, what? Wait, isn't that that guy? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> they mentioned him. I'm like, that's cool. I didn't, I forgot that he was actually going to be in the episode. So I was like, wow, they're, they're really putting these little things in there. I was like, nice. Did you figure that he would have had the kryptonite in his robot arm? No, I didn't even, I didn't realize he ever had a robot arm until they mentioned it. He sort of muscles Lex at one point, like Lex tries to threaten him or something. And he sort of says like, you're not in any position to muscle anybody, Lex. And he sort of pulls him away. And I thought, oh, okay, is this sort of supposed to be linked? to the fact that maybe he's degenerating, you know, he's losing his hair and stuff. But then he reveals this robot arm, and I didn't put it together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when he reveals it later, I'm like, oh, of course, his, his machines run on kryptonite. Exactly. So exactly. that makes sense. Yeah, so I thought that was a very good bit of continuity. And he's become, like, that Rolly Vale has become, he just seems more evil in this episode than he did in Metallo. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, he's, yeah, Metallo, he's been in prison he's... for a bit, you know, he's had to... Well, yeah, so, it's, right, it changes right. a man. <laughs> <laughs> While this is uh, going on, Lex reveals himself to Lois. And he right. does it a couple of times. You know, first he's just an old man that she helps across the street. But then he does right. the same thing again, runs into her. But he reveals himself and gives this whole speech about the phoenix rising from the ashes. Right. And then tries to talk her into coming back to him. To which, of course, she says, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. going to happen. <laughs> but, um, ugh. Again, John Shea was so good in that scene as he, you know, even even if the prosthetics, you know, didn't really make him look that different. Right. Just right. as he was pulling it all off and revealing himself to her, I was like, oh, God, yes. Finally, <laughs> a 
quality villain back. Exactly, exactly. He was great, and he's quoting Shakespeare and everything to Nigel. It's just, it was, yeah, it was classic Lex. It was really, really well done. And of course, she goes straight to the planet too and tells yeah. them, like, "Hey, I just saw Lex Luthor. <laughs> We're gonna get on this." <laughs> Yes. So that was good, you know. It's not, you know, like a lot of shows, maybe she would keep it to herself or something like that for no reason, and you'd just be like, mm-hmm. ah, why isn't she telling anybody she saw Lex? Exactly. So I like that, you know. It's Clark and Perry and everyone. Of course she's going to go straight to them. She's going to say no to Lex. Exactly. Why would she? Excellent stuff. And then, of course, they break Broly out of jail. I have to say, they break him out, right? And then there's these two guards who are in the car, and this fire comes along, and it's going to blow up the car, so Superman comes in and saves them. Right. And he has to blow out the fire. And I was like, damn, those fire effects look excellent for 1995. <laughs> I've seen movies in the last two years that still don't get fire right. Yeah, I just kind of had to throw that one out there. I was like, damn, that's good fire effects. Well done, Lois and Clark. <laughs> you know, speaking of the escape there, the driver who w- played one of the officers there was the same guy who played the uh, robot in the beginning of the Metallo episode, the one in the <laughs> old 80s mustache. That yeah. was the same actor. So talking about old actors coming back, there you go. <laughs> I love it. Great bit of trivia. There is this whole thing about Nigel being former Secret Service. Did we know this before? Right. I don't think we did. I think we probably, like, we probably could have assumed that because he did seem like he knew, like, he was the the muscle, you know, for Lex, but he, like, handled things, like, in a way that wasn't, like, typical just breaking kneecaps, you know? Like, he... He knew things. It's uh, When you think back to it, you know, he was very, like, delicate in the way he handled situations, I guess. Yeah, I know what you mean. It was, uh, I just, he seemed to do a lot more of this, like, secrety agent kind of stuff this time around, though. <laughs> yeah, this time he did, yeah. Just busting Rolly out of prison. There's a bit later where he sort of shoots Bender with a poison dart from mm-hmm. the water or something. <laughs> Lex is like, oh, if there's one thing I appreciate about Nigel is his sense of imagination. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yes. okay. I like this this little bit of information on him because, like I said, I, I liked his character before. I, I like of all his of all of Lex's assistants, I like Nigel the best. Yeah, you know. So it's nice to have this little bit in there. And it's like, and it actually made me think a little bit of uh, Batman and uh, Alfred. You know, because apparently, like Alfred has a whole history as well. And, like, in his past, Alfred was, like, a James Bond-type spy as well as what they've, yeah. they've revealed in different comics. So it's kind of neat to, to think, well, here's like, here's, like, Alfred, but, like, the opposite, like, the evil Alfred, you know? <laughs> it would have been neat to have seen, like, Alfred versus Nigel. Like in Mortal Kombat or something. Yeah, if this had been made, like, in the modern-day TV show era, we would have seen that. Yeah, I could dig that. Yeah. Rolly goes ahead and hands over the kryptonite before he gets paid. Classic classic mistake and it's a double cross of course but nigel ends up doing a super triple cross (laughs) yes (laughs) and it turns out he's now a part of intergang and he says that lex has had his time i'm over playing second fiddle to you luther i'm out of here they've got this random homeless guy working for them yeah i don't know what that that was weird what was his name? It was like Ramen or Ramon or yeah, something. Re- yeah, Ramon or Remy or something like that. <laughs> oh, Remy. Was it Remy? <laughs> or Remen? It was something like that. Yeah, but Nigel says it like five times while he's there. He's like, come with me, Ramen. <laughs> Ramin, Ramin. That's Ramin. what it was, Ramin. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, man. I know. Because, like, we only saw him, like, he led Lois and Clark there by accident. And we didn't really see he was there when he kidnapped Bender. But it wasn't like they named him then. And it wasn't like he seemed like he was anybody important. He was just like a, a nameless thug up until that point. It's like, all right. And I don't think we ever see this guy again in the series. <laughs> it's just a weird, like, I don't know what they were doing with that. I'm pretty sure he doesn't say a single word in the whole episode. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> He's just there. You get a name, but you don't get any lines. <laughs> yeah. So Lex ends up taking a crossbow to the shoulder and they got Lois there of course um, because it wouldn't be an episode if Lois didn't get kidnapped (laughs) (laughs) she falls into this rat 
pit, which doesn't seem very menacing. This is right. like four rats down there. <laughs> but Lex gets into such a frenzy over it, and Gretchen is like, why do you care about her? What about me? <laughs> as far as I was like, okay, this, this rat pit doesn't seem so menacing. No, when, he, no. <laughs> when she says, I love you, and he turns around and says, I'll kill you, and then pushes her into that electricity box, I was like, you are so evil. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good scene. And then Superman, of course, comes in and saves Lois. I honestly can't remember if Lex comes back after this i know he does and see i thought it was going to be this season but apparently it's not all right because i spoiler alert sorry but uh, i know that he comes back again because i remember another storyline that happened and i thought this is where it started but this is not where it started so i know he's coming back at some point and i don't know if, if it's third season or fourth season but he comes back and it does the uh, there's a storyline that he's involved in which is is really it's good but it's also frustrating we'll just leave it at that but the, the very least got him in a situation where it's not so final as it was at the end of season one where he's dead. Exactly. Like he's in prison and we can get back to him whenever we can get Johnny Shea back into the show. Like whenever his contract right. works out <laughs> exactly. or something. <laughs> Which is good. Exactly. Yeah. And the fact that Nigel got away with the kryptonite as well. So we know kryptonite's yeah. still out mm -hmm. there somewhere. And not in the exactly. hands of Rolly Vale who was in prison. Um, and the fact that he tries to kill himself again as well. I'm not surprised. Right, because he wants—he doesn't want to be held, like you said, I'll be no held no prisoner or whatever. It was you know, It's like he's going to be free just by killing himself. And Superman's like, nope, not going to happen again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm prepared this time, Luther. <laughs> exactly. You're not taking the easy way out. <laughs> so I think all, all in all, I love this episode. It was so yeah, good. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> That's what I said last week. Yeah, it's the best bad guy. Yeah. Shame that we don't get more of him. Yeah, it's a shame too because then we have the next episode, which is like, how do you live up to this? You know? <laughs> It's like, sorry, Raquel Welch. That up. Damn it. <laughs> Does not happen. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into a few bylines for the episode. Yeah. What do you think of Pearl Jam, man? Woo! <laughs> Yes, they were not my, like, I, I never really got big into Pearl Jam, which I know is like saying something evil. People are like, what? How could you not be into Pearl Jam? But yeah, it was it was kind of <laughs> neat to see the little, you know, the the nod towards them. What I found out was, I think this is this was from the uh, Superman homepage again, the, uh, the whole Pearl Jam thing and the tickets being so expensive was actually something that happened in real life. I guess they boycotted Ticketmaster or something because Ticketmaster was like overcharging for their right. tickets. So it's a little nod to that. I thought that was cool. But it heavily dates the episode, right? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they couldn't have just come up with a fake. It's not like Pearl Jam was in the episode. Right. You never saw him. And uh, we also get the whole thing with Jimmy, too, because Jimmy ends up getting the tickets when Lois yes. and Clark can't go on their date. And he mentions Angela. Yes. So apparently he and Angela are still going strong. Right. And I, I don't, we don't ever see her again. But it's funny <laughs> that the writers decided to put that in there because, like Dean Cain said in, that, in the commentary, that he wanted her to be a recurring character, but he was mm. overruled. We're never going to see her again, but at least the writers, you know, said, well, he wanted her to be a recurring character, so let's just mention her, you know, once in a while. Yeah, I didn't mind it. I thought it was uh, an interesting touch, even if we're never going to see her again. Now, this is something that uh, I Reactions had mentioned in his emails with the deleted scenes and everything about Luther and his attitude towards uh, Intergang. You know, Nigel told him that, you know, well, Intergang is just a bunch of thugs and, mm -hmm. you know, Lex calls them jackals, you know, and he said it's it seemed weird to to him that uh, Lex would have this attitude towards inner gang because Lex wasn't really a crime boss himself. He didn't like head up the crime boss thing, um, but it seemed like he was kind of like in competition with inner gang the way he, the way they were talking. You know, and he said, you no, know, likely Luther would probably be a client of Inner Gang rather than trying to be a competitor. And I don't know. What do you, what do you think about that Luther versus Inner Gang? Would he be working with them or for them? Or I, I like the idea that Luther wouldn't have to work with Inner Gang. I mean, right, we, yeah. we know that he was he was the third richest man in the world. So, right. you know, he's so rich that he has his own little evil thing by himself. He doesn't yes. need this conglomerate of sorts. Right. Right. I mean, I could see like if, if Luther was still in power with all his money, I, could, I guess I could see him hiring Intergang to do some stuff for him. But I, just, I think he would feel so above them. 
You know, like he would not feel like they were anything that he would have to worry about. They would be something that he would use if he needed them. Exactly. If he worked with them or even for them, then he would have to share everything. And that's exactly. not worth it at all. He wants everything right. for himself. So, yeah, I was kind of like, I was like, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I don't think he would be. I think his attitude is good because it's like, oh, it's just an inner gang. They're just thugs. We don't. I, who cares about them? I don't care about them. You know, like that's that's his thinking. He, he's above them. Even at this point where he doesn't have any money, if he wanted to, I think his belief is, you know, even at this stage, without my money, without my power, I can still take them down. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, I put this one in the bylines, but mm -hmm. Lois and Clark's almost first date. They were getting pretty hot for each other. <laughs> they were. It was it was a little cheesy. I mean, at first, Lois goes into that room, and this comes up in the uh, back issues. But it's like Lois goes in there. She's in front of the door, and he could see her silhouette, okay? And that's fine, you know? But then Clark goes in. He knows that you can see through that door, and he goes <laughs> right by the door and does the same exact thing. And it's like, what? I mean, come on. Is he doing it on purpose? <laughs> what? Yes, he's doing it on purpose. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'm going to give her a little cheesecake here. Because he sort of adjusts his glasses a bit, and I was thinking, is he going to try and use his x-ray vision to look through? <laughs> right. And then when Lois is looking at his silhouette there, and you can see all these, like, pecs in their full glory and all that. Right, yeah. And she starts spilling the champagne. <laughs> uh -huh. I thought it was good. It was a little back yeah, and forth it was there. It was then, funny, yeah. yeah. And then lastly, Perry knows everything, even how to yodel. <laughs> he's been around a long time. <laughs> he's a good He's a good editor. What can I say? I thought he, he had some good parts in this episode, you know, with the whole bomb thing. and Yes. You know, he's flying there with Superman. He goes, oh, it's a great view for my beer, Superman. I wish it was under <laughs> different circumstances. <laughs> It's always good to see him. But then the whole line, of course, you know, he knows everything. And as he walks away, he gives that little yodely. <laughs> Great touch. More Perry. I think we say it almost every episode. <laughs> yes, exactly. More, more Perry, Perry please. <laughs> okay, well, let's get into the quote vote, shall we? What's everybody standing around for? It's a newspaper. Not happy hour at Buckingham Palace. What are we here? The Daily Planet? We're second stringers from the Weehawken Gazette. Oh, oh, am I making myself perfectly clear? Very few people voting this week. I'm quite disappointed. Oh, this is sad. It's a sad day for the Rewatch podcast. <sighs> but we have a winner, so let's get into it. Cue the music. Kermit the Frog and Bobcat Goldwaith talk on a couch. I did feel bad because after I finished rationalizing it, I realized a big part of why I did it was because I don't like you. Really? Oh, God, that is such a relief. I don't like you either. Really? Really. Oh, that makes me feel so much better. I couldn't stand the idea that I was jealous because of Clark. It's so petty. I know. I mean, it feels so much better to just... To just dislike you because you're you. Ah. Yay! <laughs> and and see. Had to get the yay in there. <laughs> I was just thinking that as I finished, I was like, what can I what can I do just to cat this <laughs> off? I'll give it a ah. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. Okay, well let's get into our second episode discussion today. And the episode is Top Copy, written by John McNamara and directed by Randall Zisk. And this originally aired February nineteenth of nineteen ninety five. It's all right fires out. Superman, thank you so much. I'm Diana Stride. Yes, Miss Stride. I've seen your news show. Really? You watch TV? Once in a while. <laughs> this is my cameraman, Rolf. Pleasure. What exactly were you two doing up here, anyway? We came to get some vista shots for a piece Diana's doing on Urban Renewal. And then just stumbled into an exclusive. I can't imagine how this fire got started. Can you, Rolf? I simply can't. Well, I checked the elevators. They're still working. Once the smoke clears, you should be able to get down just fine. Superman, if there's ever anything I can do for you, I... Take care, Miss Stride. Uh, nice to meet you, Rolf. And you? So good. So decent. Don't you just want to vomit? 
Nice quads, though. Hmm. Ah, it's working. We can track him now. Huh. Wait, what's wrong? He's so fast, he just flew right out of range. Well, we'll get him in range again. When a fire breaks out atop a building, a woman jumps from the ledge but is quickly saved by Superman. The woman turns out to be Diana Stride, a reporter for a tabloid TV show who wants to do an expose on Superman and stage the fire and fall in order to place a tracking device on the Man of Steel. The device leads Diana and her assistant Rolf to the Daily Planet, but Clark hears them coming and quickly switches to his Superman uniform, throwing them off the trail, and then uses his heat vision to destroy her tracker. Meanwhile, at Miss Lois and Clark's on-again, off-again date plans, Perry reveals that an inner gang employee has turned informant and wants them to get the story. The duo try to get information from Mason, with Clark using his masculine wiles, but in the end, it's Lois's anything-for-a-story attitude that gets them the information they need when she steals Mason's beeper and grabs the phone numbers off of it. They manage to find the safe house that houses the informant, who unfortunately has just been shot by Diana, a secret agent for Inner Gang. She tries to finish the job at the hospital where the shot informant was taken, but Lois intervenes and fights Diana, who escapes out a window. Mason arrives at the planet and demands that Lois and Clark reveal how they found the safe house threatening them with a grand jury unless they do. Eventually, Lois concedes and apologizes for taking the beeper, and the two find common ground with a mutual distaste for each other. Elsewhere, Diana calls Clark to ask him to send Superman as soon as possible, which he does, and is quickly taken aback as Diana tries to seduce him, kissing him with kryptonite-laden lipstick, which immediately causes him to get weak, but still manages to escape. Clark returns to the planet where Diana returns with a new tracker, but Clark gets away just in time, returning home to call his parents about the kryptonite, which has made it into his system. Diana and Ralph follow the tracker and through Clark's window sees him change into Superman. Unfortunately, Ralph's camera battery goes dead at that exact moment. Wah, wah. While in the hospital, Lois and the doctor help Superman come up with an idea to save himself from the kryptonite invading his body like a cancer, to burn it out of his system with a radiation treatment, only on a massive scale by way of a nuclear power plant. Superman emerges, healed, and ready to take the fight to Diana. Just as she is exposing Superman's secret identity on her TV show, Martha, Jonathan, and Clark use a hologram his mother was using for a class to show both both Superman and Clark in the same place at one time, making the world believe that Diana's expose was just a hoax. I know your story isn't a tribute. It's an attempt to expose me. Expose you? Do you have something to hide? We all have something to hide, Miss Stride. Some of us for the good of others, and some of us for their own gain. I'm here to tell you, Miss Stride, Drop the story. Superman, I... I can't. You see, if I drop the story, I'm going to lose my show. And that's all I have. When you want so much from life, and then you get even more than you ever expected. The thought of having it all taken away... can make you do things. Things that you never even thought you were capable of. Don't, don't, don't cry. That's why I did this. Or maybe it's just because I'm no damn good. There's good in everyone. Not on the first date. Uh, you don't want me as an enemy, Miss Stride. Uh, but I've got you. Yes. I've got you under your skin. <laughs> Okay, so a bit in our investigation here. So in the script, Clark was supposed to be writing notes when Lois steals Mason's beeper, so he wasn't supposed to really notice it. And I, he didn't really notice it in the script, but or in the uh, show, but he was supposed to be more distracted, I guess, in the actual script. When Lois is guessing what Clark is doing when he's, like, saying she's reaching, you know, for the for the theory, it didn't say that in the script. She was supposed to just, like, she just came up with that. Terry improvised the whole, you're stretching, you're groping, grasping, you know, that was just, just her making up some extra words there for that scene. In the script, Diana says, this is, this is terrible. In the script, Diana says, oh, my necklace is at the cleaners. What? 
<laughs> is that the cleaners? Okay. I know jewelry has to get cleaned once in a while, but still, that's such a... <laughs> I mean, John McNamara, that's that's the best you can come up with in the script. <laughs> You know, I mean, come on. That can't be my necklace because mine is at the cleaners. The cleaners. Yeah, hmm. that's the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it makes more sense that she would just be like, no, it's not mine. Exactly. <laughs> just deny, deny. In the script, Clark doesn't actually ask Lois for aspirin. He just says, I'm going out for some aspirin. And then she says, oh, I have some. And as she turns her back, he just takes that opportunity to super speed away. So it's a little changed uh, premise there. After Lois and uh, Mason have their little discussion about hating each other, Mason was supposed to offer her some popcorn for some reason. I don't know. They cut that out. <laughs> Not a big deal. And then finally, in the script, this was a, a something that probably would have been good to have in there. There was a shot. Just an establishing shot that shows Superman putting a speaker up on the Daily Planet globe. So that was what enabled the hologram to have sound. Because, of course, holograms don't have sound. They're just, you know, visual. So they showed that that part of it. Well, I think we'll get into the logistics of the hologram when we get to it. Yes. Uh, great. I'll be here in the apartment. No, Clark, you get yourself to a hospital. Oh, Dad, what are they going to do? They can't operate on me. I'd break the scalpels. Well, there's got to be something they can do. I guess you're right. But I'd better go as Superman. No, Superman doesn't have insurance, but I'm sure we'll work something out. I love you, too. Get down. Get down. Pack is dead. <laughs> the camera won't work. I must go to get a fresh battery pack. Go get it. <laughs> All right, so let's get into our main story. And our lead here an extreme expose. Find out tonight at six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we kick off this one, and Lois finally says that she's ready to go on a date with Clark. Yes, <laughs> finally. But of course, these two have the worst timing in the world, and Clark has to take off because there is a penthouse on fire. Yes. And this woman has intentionally set fire to her apartment, so Superman will come and save her. And I mean, she is really expecting Superman to show up. She leaps from the building and everything. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. All in the attempt to get a one on one interview with Superman. Now, this character is Diana Stride, played by the one and only Raquel Welch. Yes. And boy, oh boy, does she ham this roll up. I don't think it might not have been so bad if we had not just come off of, you know, a Lex episode because he plays Lex so good, he doesn't ham it up. You know, he, like, he plays him very seriously and everything. Even when he is being a little silly, it doesn't come off as, like, super hammy. But this character, oh, man. Yeah, and you know what really accentuates that? Is that they give her this cameraman <laughs> named <Yes>. Rolf. <laughs> yeah. And he is super hamming it up the whole time. Oh, my God, yes. So it's like they're dueling back and forth for who can be hammier. I know, it's like ham and cheese with a side of ham. <laughs> and extra cheese, why not? <laughs> Yeah, but I, you know, I don't mind the character of Diana Stride, but I really love that character, Rolf. Oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty amusing. He was pretty amusing. Well, we'll get to him in the in the byline. So she's like a reporter for this TV program called Top Copy. Pretty much, it's a play on Barbara Walters, right? But yeah. but a more extreme, over the top version of Barbara exactly. Walters, right? <laughs> exactly. She has like interviewed everybody, world leaders, all that stuff, made people cry. Mm -hmm. And she wants yes. Superman to sit down on the couch with her and have a heart-to-heart. -heart. He kind of, sort of says he'll do it, but he really, he's just shrugging her off, right? Yeah, exactly. So she's going to try and do anything to get this interview. But in the meantime, over at the planet, they're covering the story about a guy that they refer to as Mr. X. And he is a key member of Intergang, who is going to testify about Intergang's best assassin. I really didn't think the two stories would intertwine the way they do. Right. 
Right. Me neither. <laughs> this idea that Diana is the assassin. I just, I don't know. What do you think? First, when this story about Mr. X, I don't know. Like, we haven't seen a great deal about Inner Gang aside from that one episode where they were first introduced, you know? We saw the, the guy who's behind it. We saw he has, like, a worldwide network. We saw the lawyer who approached Superman. That whole episode. And then they're kind of just gone. We hear them being talked about. And it's, but it's like they don't seem that dangerous. You know, it's like they're, they're kind of there, but we don't really know everything that's going on. It's like that was one episode, and then that's all we have from Inner Gang. And suddenly now there's a guy from Inner Gang who's going to testify for some reason. It just seemed out of the blue for me. Like, I wish they had set this up more. I was just like, why are we talking about Inner Gang? Like, we barely even heard about it. Let's go back to Lex, you know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> so I was just, I was a little, like, put off. I was like, oh, well, whatever, fine, you know? When we found out that Diana was the uh, assassin, I'm like, yeah, okay, why not? <laughs> I mean, go with it. You got to, like, we just, you know, we suspend... Our uh, disbelief for many things, and I'm like, all right, well, I'll, I'll, that's fine. She's, <laughs> she's she reminded me of the Black Widow when she was all duded up in the uh, the leather, you know, especially with the the red hair and everything. Like, oh, look at the Black Widows here. Yeah, but there's really nothing about this woman's personality that kind of makes you think that she's an assassin. Which no. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's what they were going for. They're just saying that she's so good at her job that nobody would assume that she is actually an assassin. So if that's what they're going for, I guess they didn't. Know job in that yeah i suppose i just i kind of have a bit of trouble believing that she's like the best assassin in the whole world and she's taken out all these world leaders and stuff like that i know seriously she is also doing all this stuff where she's like tagged superman with this like radioactive material or something so she can right. sort of sneak up on him and she's getting ready to sneak up on clark over at the daily planet yeah this was good i thought this was good so she's sleuthing around and of course you know clark's hearing them coming up the elevator and everything. Here's what everybody's saying. You know, he has a couple of close shaves with that and, you know, only just manages to sort of speed off and then come back as Superman and be like, why are you following me? Right. <laughs> they have this guy who works for Intergang and he's kind of like giving Diana her orders... I guess. Right. He Skypes in, sends her a coded message through a flickering lamp. So he Skypes in, and I don't think they ever say his name, but according to IMDb, this guy's name is Mr. Daryl, <laughs> played by Robert Culp. Yeah, you know Robert Culp, right? I know Robert Culp. Okay. <laughs> Strangely enough, I did. the first time I ever saw him was in Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. <laughs> but uh, he was in... Um, the Greatest American Hero. Greatest American Hero. Thank you. He played the uh, government sidekick to uh, the superhero teacher. So he's Mr. Daryl, and he Skypes in a couple of times. It's like they just got Robert Cole and, you know, just shot him against a back screen at his own house or something. Oh, yeah. Over exactly. a couple of hours. <laughs> and see, that's and that's like the whole thing. I'm like, why didn't they get uh, Peter Boyle? Because he's the head of the whole thing. Right. We, we know him. He's established already. Why not just get him back for this little this little bit that he has to do, you know, and then just shoot him, you know, saying the lines? Because, I don't know, I just that's why I was like, eh, all right, fine. I mean, I like Robert Culp and everything, but I'm like, I just want some more. I don't know. I, I want to hear, I want to see this. this this operation in place. Like, I want to see what Inner Gang actually does. Well, have some more continuity with the whole thing, too, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because who is this guy? You know, like, who, where, where is he? Because he wasn't on those video screens when, uh, you know, in that episode where, uh, what's his name? The Cosmart guy, you know, was, like, talking to all the world leaders. Like, he wasn't there. He wasn't around. It's like, all right, well. Maybe Peter Boyle wasn't uh, available, so they said, let's get this guy. Well, that's what I mean. Like, th this was obviously just, you know, some sort of cityscape backdrop that right. they shot him against, and then he shows up on a, a TV screen a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Like, the guy probably didn't even have to leave his own house for them to film this. They could have just <laughs> gone to him to done it and taken yeah. you know, a couple of hours. He got his quick paycheck, and off he went. Thanks, Robert Cole. Exactly. Yeah. So why they couldn't go to uh, Old Mate's place and... Uh, have some continuity to the story, I don't know. But you're right. We don't know who this guy is. He just works for Intergang. Because yeah. everybody works for Intergang. If everybody works mm, for Intergang, then who are they trying to take over? <laughs> exactly. That's yeah, point. exactly. That's my whole point. <laughs> it's like, what is Intergang? I mean, come on. Let's hear more about it. So hopefully they're going to develop it a lot more as we get into this season. I thought that Peter Boyle was in it a lot more. But maybe it's maybe it's just that one episode, and I'm forgetting that, he, that he's not in it beyond that. I know that we do get more with his family. I know there's some more churches coming, you know, some more of his, of his family. 
But I thought we had more Peter Boyle, but maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'm just misremembering. But um, Lois and Clark, they cannot find out anything about this Mr. X character. Right. right. And Lois seems to just, like, freaking lose her shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> because they can't find any info out. Clark wants to talk to Mason again. Right. And she just up and steals Mason's beeper. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so she can, like, find out who's been calling her or who wants to call her. And then they trace it back to the safe house, which you know, right. seems like a really unsafe thing to do. Even for mm -hmm. a DA to have that in their beeper. But whatever. But they go along... With Jimmy, too. They drag Jimmy into this. And they go to the safe house and find that it's this guy, DeSanto, who used to work for Diana? I don't know. Was he, like, her cameraman before Rolf? <laughs> I don't know. Or I... did they work together in Intergang? Yeah, I think they just said that she or that he was a, a former partner. So I would assume that it was, like, an Intergang type thing. Of course, Diana shows up and tries to kill him with her super sleuth assassin skills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But she's so much of a super sleuth that she wears a very distinctive bit of jewelry and yeah. drops it <laughs> yes. while she's there. This kind of gets Lois on her trail as well. Diana decides that she's going to go after Superman if Intergang can provide her with the kryptonite that they have, which presumably they got from Nigel. So what did you think of this whole bit with Diana poisoning superman with her kryptonite lipstick i was kind of, i thought that was kind of neat because it, it makes sense she puts it on like she gets it ground down to paste or whatever and then puts it on her lips so when he does show up you know he's he's not thinking there's any danger so he goes real close and then you know you have the lipstick kryptonite which is it affects him you know so he's she kisses him and there you go he's like down for the count so i like that idea it's a different way of using the kryptonite like unsuspecting like he didn't he didn't have any idea it was gonna happen it's just like boom yeah it is an interesting idea because up until now in the show at least we've seen superman like be affected by the kryptonite when it's near him to see what actually happens when it actually he swallows some of it it gets into right. his bloodstream mm -hmm. just how paralyzing that is for him that was a cool idea the problem is not with that the problem i have is with how he actually cures himself like going into the um the nuclear reactor mm. to uh <laughs> to burn it out i mean it sounds it sounds real good and everything but i was always thinking like i don't know that seems that seems weird and so like I was reading about it on uh, the uh, fans of Lois and Clark wiki. They said some stuff about it on there about how the radiation treatment would actually work. And that's <laughs> the science is a little sketchy on, on, on going into a nuclear reactor like that and trying to burn it out that way. Well, I have to admit, when they started talking about it like it was cancer and I was yes. saying, OK, so, you know, usually with cancer, we would put in chemotherapy and stuff like that. And then he says, you know, we need something a bit stronger, really. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Clark has encountered kryptonite before like just being near it right. and he's you know been cut you know they, he got a cut on his face remember and then he used his heat vision to oh, yeah. seal that up to cauterize the wound so I, when he was like i'm gonna go into the nuclear power plant i'm like yeah but you're weakened by kryptonite like wouldn't you go in there and <laughs> it would just like shred you what are you wolverine yeah. now you can just like super heal <laughs> Right. I thought he was going to go into the sun. Right. That's what I was thinking originally. That would have made more sense. Up to the sun. Yeah, that's fine why I'm, with that. <laughs> that's why I'm like, why is he going to the power plant? Like, the sun would be, like, that's a source of his power. So, like, to burn it out, why not go up to the sun? Exactly. Like, he didn't have to go into the sun. Like, if he just went really close to the sun and just, like, sucked in the, the sun rays or something like that, I would have been like, cool. That's also, like, Superman gets his powers because of Earth's yellow sun. Yep. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Yep. But, yeah, <laughs> nuclear power plant, I'm like, no, he should have died. <laughs> like, for real died. Not like, you know, right. the issue where Superman died. Like, And you're like, well, Superman's not dead. He's going to come back. No, he should have yes. just straight up died. This should have been the end of the series. <laughs> <laughs> right here. <laughs> Take an issue with it. But, yeah, of course he gets all cured from it. He's not dead. He's Superman. <laughs> and then Diana gasses a hospital to get to DeSanto. Yes. Lois has to grab this random tank to save Mason, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> they're there, the gas comes in, Lois is like, oh my God, it's gas. Grabs a random tank, sticks it on her face. <laughs> and I was like, you're going to read that? It could be anything. <laughs> Exactly. It was because it was just so quick too. I'm like, she didn't stop. She didn't look at it. Is this oxygen? Uh, who cares? She just whacked <laughs> it tank. on her face. 
Yeah. So I'm taking issue with that as well. Right. <laughs> but then Clark is revealed as Superman to the whole world. I thought this was, I like this. I like this whole, this whole thing where, you know, like she saw them or uh, Diana and Rolf saw them uh, changing. He pulls open his shirt and the mm-hmm. uniforms underneath, you know, because he's just, he's not feeling well from the kryptonite and everything. I think that was a really cool scene. I was like, oh man, they got it. And then this is like in my synopsis, this is when I did the wah, wah, because like right at that moment, like his camera battery dies i mean come on <laughs> i mean this is just so see that's part of the thing that i'm like it's so cheesy it's like come on really yeah i think i'm there with you like the whole thing about because she's an investigative journalist you know albeit yeah. for this schlocky top copy tv show you know she she finds it out and you think oh crap clark is is found out but then the battery on the camera dies. And then to prove it, they have Martha doing like a laser hologram art piece. And she uses that to make a Superman appear with yeah. Clark. And I'm like, oh, God. It's like, I understand that Martha is trying to better herself by taking all these classes and everything. They've set that up. They've established that. But it's just odd. Like they're doing like a hologram project in class. You know, like, and a hologram project that they are able to modify so well that it it's a full size in color hologram of Superman. It just it's very it's a little <laughs> bit it's stretching my beliefs a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, I was like, did they record this at some point to project right. this hologram, or did she make this from scratch? That's a, a you know a fully perfectly good looking Superman that can talk to everybody. And answer yeah. questions. Yeah, uh, it was just, it was a bit over the top. I mean, they haven't set up this world as being like super technologically advanced. You'd have trouble building a hologram today. What yeah. average person could build a hologram? Exactly. Let alone a woman who lives on a farm in Kansas who's sort of into art as a hobby. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It was just too beyond belief. That's the problem with these episodes that are like villain of the week type things. Because you got to wrap it up, you know. You got to ha- you you put in some kind of situation that's like major. Like, oh, how are they gonna get out of this? And it's like, oh, very simple. We're just gonna do this. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, it's like it's the stories, the comic book stories from like the fifties and the and the sixties, where everything was a little bit like convenient and cheesy, just to wrap it up by the end of the uh, the issue. You know, there wasn't like major stories that went on from issue to issue it was like all just one self-contained you know so you didn't have to worry about buying another issue it was that that's what these these uh villain of the week episodes remind me of like just really mm. old school just you know here's a problem here's how we solve it done you know no no deeper thinking and uh, you know it's it's not like they haven't like had weird advancements in technologies and stuff like that. i mean we had a robot a couple of episodes back and you know i think the pilot episode had that space station and stuff so it's not like they didn't go mm-hmm. like out of that realm but i'm just like holy Hologram, really? Like, <laughs> the show, even with, you know, these little bits of, like, robots and space stations and whatnot, is still firmly set in the mid-90s. Like, there's nothing about it that said this is set any later than the mid-90s. So, right. yeah, that one, it just threw me off. I mean, the best thing about this, this episode here which a lot of people had mentioned in the uh, the back issues, was when they do make that revelation, like, Lois is just, like, dead quiet as they're all watching the TV show. Like, and she's just staring at the screen with nothing, you know, everyone's commenting on it, and she's just sort of staring at it. And, like, you're wondering, like, what's going through her head? Is she starting to put it together now, maybe? Because all these excuses that he has, you know, he just disappears, Superman shows up, the conversations she's had with both, is she, she's putting it together in her head? You know, or is she just in total shock? Like, I want, you know, I think she played it really, really well, especially when they go out and Clark has the uh, the press conference and she's watching the whole thing. There's There was a scene in there where the Superman, the hologram flickers for a moment. And there was something about the way she, it was very subtle, but the way Lois was like looking at that hologram i think Mm -hmm. this is where it all starts yeah you're right she does get a look that says like what the hell was that yeah exactly something's not right here Mm -hmm. but yeah and it's all done with looks like lois isn't saying anything this whole time it's just all about how she looks and how she takes in the information Mm -hmm. that's coming at her and that part is actually really good yeah i do enjoy that and it makes you wonder how this is going to play out in episodes to come you know is she going to continue to question this is this a thought that's been planted and won't go away Mm -hmm. we'll find out i guess it's uh i'm I'm excited because i i saw the list i was uh putting some copies of this uh, of the episodes on my uh, google drive so i can actually watch them on the go like i used to do with sliders and i 
I saw some of the titles, and I'm like, oh, okay. So we got. I know that I I sort of remember the storyline that's coming up, and it has to do with like this type of thing, the secret identity thing. So I'm like, all right, I'm excited for this. Cute. Not not next week, but but soon. But coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. All in all, you know, the story was a bit so so. There yeah. were some points in there that were really sticking for me. The bit at the end, yeah, with Lois was pretty good. So, I don't know. I'm just going to come down on a yeah for this episode. Yeah, if we if we had uh, not come off such a good villain episode with Lex, I think we'd be a little bit more forgiving. It's just yeah. that our, we just set our sights so high because of what just happened. <laughs> you know, it was like it was so good. And then you get this so-so episode after it. Well, some bylines for the episode. I thought it was really funny where Jimmy comments on Clark's new glasses and then he tries to take him off so he can yeah. try them on <laughs> and he has to be like, whoa, no, I've, I've got to... Really strong prescription. Like, you might you know, hurt <laughs> exactly. yourself if you put them on. <laughs> that was a funny moment. I have to mention Rolf again. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this guy was like, <laughs> he was so weird. He has like little sideline comments <laughs> that kind of make you yes. think like he really enjoys being punished. Yes. Oh, God. He was creepy. Like, that's what I had in my notes. I was like, Rolf is creepy. He actually says to Superman at one point, like, um, do you need to hit me, Superman, or something like that? And I was like, <laughs> yes, yes. okay, weird. But then when he was talking to him about his very tightest ski pants. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, was, Superman's just like, something. I'm not going to give you advice on what you wear. <laughs> I know, seriously. Like, you can... You can spank me if you want to. It's okay. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. But even from the get go, when um, you know, he's got the camera set up mm-hmm. when uh, Superman saves Diana, and they just and she's just like, "This is my cameraman, Ruff," and he just puts his head out from behind the camera and he goes, "Pleasure." <laughs> and goes right back to uh, <laughs> recording. I was like, exactly. Oh, this guy's great. Okay, so uh, Lois is upset with Clark for leaving to quote unquote return a tape. Yeah, that was that was a bad excuse, <laughs> you know. And that's something that I was actually going to mention because as we go on now, okay, after this whole you know reveal where okay, fine, Superman and Clark are two, in two different places, so they can't be it. But after this, I think his excuses are really wearing thin on her. You know, like you have to return a tape. I'm talking like she's talking about like burying her soul to him, and he's like, I got to go return this tape. I'll be yeah, back. that's almost as bad as the um, cheese of the month or whatever it was. That yeah, time. <laughs> exactly the cheese of the month club. Yeah, but I think now that now that she has this little germ planted in her head, this germ of an idea, it's like I think these this, the excuses are just going to get more frustrating. And then you know, our Perry for the episode is actually him constantly reiterating this story of two other reporters who fell in love and it yes. didn't work out and then the two of them fell into like crap jobs afterwards like then they, they exactly. were no longer reporters because their relationship failed yep. and i'm like well that's just depressing perry thanks <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Uh, and then, of course, with Mason being in the episode two, you know, so Clark was sort this of trying, yeah, he's trying to set up a date with Lois, but then he has to return yeah. a tape, so she's pissed at him. But then they're talking to Mason, and she really wants to rekindle stuff. Yeah, and Clark's using that to his advantage. He's, like, playing around with hmm. her, you know? I'm like, come on, man, that's not cool. You know you're not interested in her, really. I mean, yeah, you might be somewhat attracted because she's not, you know, into Superman at all, but she's more interested in, in the Clark side, but still, it's like he's he's really like using his like I said, m- using his masculine wiles to get what he wants out of her. And yeah, he promises to call her, but does he? You know what I mean? Yeah, not at least not in this episode. Well, and they're trying to play it out as well. I'm thinking anyway because of the conversation with Lois and Mason, where she just says, mm-hmm. "Look, I just I just don't like you." <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's going to naturally, I think, come down to who will Clark pick. It'll have to come down to a choice. Does he want Lois or does he want Mason? And he'll probably oh, choose yeah, Lois exactly. and then Mason will be out of the yeah. picture forever. Well, see, now, and this was weird, too, because just last just last week we had the episode where Mason heard that Lois had been attacked or something and she came by to see if she was okay. Right. Like that doesn't sound like someone who goes who doesn't like someone. Yeah, why didn't she just stay at home? Yeah, because like you are I mean if you really don't like someone, why are you going to check on them to see if they're okay? Like I know they're trying to set up this rivalry between the two of them with Clark and everything. This season they don't really have the love triangle of Superman, Clark and Lois. So now the love triangle is Clark, Lois and Mason. So that I think that's what, why they're doing it like that but it just didn't fit with what came before exactly and if if mason was just trying to keep up the pretense that she 
did want to be friends with Lois just to be close to Clark. Going right. out of her way to go and see her is still kind of a bit extreme right. just to keep up that pretense. So it is what it is. My name is Clark Kent. I'm sure you all saw the story on television tonight. And I'd just like to say... Clark, I don't mean to interrupt, but it'd probably be a lot easier if I explained everything. Diana Stride is now a wanted fugitive. Jonathan, there's a blip in the hologram. Her contention that I am Clark Kent is an attempt to deflect the fact that she has long been using her celebrity as a cover so that she may operate freely as an assassin for inner gang. Oh, boy. What am I doing playing with lasers on a farm? You're helping our son. Now get your telemetry straight. Clark Kent is a friend of mine. My uniforms were hanging in his closet because he was kind enough to clean them for me. I don't have a washing machine. I don't have a place to hang my spare capes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got someone to pick up. Well, any questions? Well, shall we get into some back issues? Yeah. So for this episode, someone had said uh, they posted about Clark's vanishing acts. You know, just like we had sort of I had mentioned about the excuses. They said the way he keeps uh, vanishing has, has got to be churning away somewhere in mm-hmm. Lois's mind. You know, Lois kissed both Clark and Superman. If they're the same person, they probably kissed the same way. And, you know, Lois should be able to tell. And she's, they said they think Lois just accepted Clark's press conference too easy. She's too, you know, she's over enthusiastic about most things, but if she's really in love with Superman, you know, she'd probe a little bit deeper into the top copy story because it's it's now it's in her head, you know. And then people sort of respond to that saying, "Well, if you notice this, you know, she was she was kind of staring when that flicker happened and they went back and forth on it for a little bit." But yeah, that basically what we're saying, you know, same type of thing. Right. And then uh, here's the one of the responses was like, "No, did, did it seem to anyone else that Lois looked at the hologram of Superman?" And kind of funny like she suspected something you know it looked like she was thinking something wasn't quite right and other people were like yeah that you know she probably knows at this point or now she's starting to think that way and they were saying why doesn't uh why doesn't she just go and confront clark why doesn't she say something about it and people were saying well you know it's possible that she knows and she's just giving clark the chance to come forward first you know because technically he's lied to her a lot you know, so if he comes to her first and, and admits, OK, I want to tell you the truth. I, I've been lying. I am Superman. It'd be better than her just like going to him and saying, I know you're Superman. You've been lying to me all this time. So mm-hmm. that, that was their reasoning for it. Anyway. Well, I don't know. I think as a journalist and it would be in her character to investigate it further. Yeah. And then once oh, yeah. she found out the truth, then she would stew on it, mm-hmm. expecting Clark or Superman to come forward. Right. And then uh, for the Phoenix, uh, they said, you know, the Perry Superman flight scene looked actually really good. Mm. You know, probably the best, uh, the good, the best post production they had in that episode. I don't remember anything in particular about it, you know, but I guess, yeah, I don't know if they did that, uh, if they did that with wires or whatever, but they said, yeah, it looked really amazing. Everything. Maybe they just had a bit more. money in the budget for this episode since they were bringing yeah. Lex back and all that. Uh, someone was saying that Lois is just dishonest. You know, Mason's a better fit for Clark. Lois just can't be truthful with her feelings. She used to, you know, it, it's like, I, I can understand that because Lois does steal the beeper. She does anything for a story. She, you know, she stole the story from Clark in the first season. And, you know, Mason does seem to have morals that kind of fit better, that line up better with Clark's morals. Um, but then someone else said, well, you got to remember that uh, Lois said in the first season, first episode, that she never gets involved with anyone she works with. You know, so when Clark and, and uh, Lois are starting to get together, there's probably a ton of warning bells going off in her head. It's bringing up the past when she's got hurt. You know, uh, even Superman rejected her last year. So she's kind of been hurt a lot. So she's very guarded. It's not that she's dishonest. She's, just, she's a little bit more guarded with, you know, who she lets into her life. Mm-hmm 
can go with that. They liked that Nigel betrayed Lex, which I did too. I thought that was mm-hmm. great. But they they hated the whole standing in the silhouette of the door. You know, Lois did it accidentally, but then Clark does it on yeah. purpose, like we said. <laughs> and then, of course, there was a lot of talk about the Pearl Jam uh, joke about the uh, high cost of tickets and the Ticketmaster thing. So we're we're right on right on with what they were thinking back in '95. Cool. And then we have just this one little bit of personal ads because I I wasn't sure where to put it, but it seemed it seemed like this is a good place to put it because you know our reactions, of course, our official show researcher sent us uh, you know the deleted scenes and the, the changes from the script to scene and all that and uh it was just it amused me because he was talking about this episode this uh the top copy and he he said in the script when meeting with mason clark is scribbling notes on a pad and not noticing when lois steals mason's gadget thing what is that i'm sorry i didn't engage with mobile devices until the ipad 2 in 2011 <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny because, yeah, it, you know, who uses a beeper anymore? You know, I, I wonder if many people know what a beeper is. You know, it's kind of it was kind of funny. I, I'm sure he's being sarcastic. But, yeah, I remember when people had beepers. I had friends who had beepers before because cell phones were not big when I was in high school. But they had a beeper, you know, that they would uh, receive like a phone call or they would receive a message on it that saying, you know, your parents are trying to call you. So you had to find a phone and call them back. I, I remember all that. Yeah, I'm, I know what a beeper is, but I'm a bit too young to have ever actually used one yeah i i had I, I never had one i had a i think i had a girlfriend who had one and i remember i was like i can't figure this out how do you add a number in here what do you do <laughs> whatever so i remember them i i just i never had one myself just trying to figure them out when i was like <laughs> you know in high school yeah. Okay, so in our next issue, we'll be discussing Return of the Prankster and Lucky Leon. So I think we can assume safely that Return of the Prankster (laughs) will be all about... Metallo, right? Metallo. It's all about Metallo? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe Lex will show back up. Oh, yes. That's probably... It'd be a fantastic episode. Completely. (laughs) (laughs) Lucky Leon. I don't know. Just the, the name... Makes me think of like the old gangsters, you know, right. the uh, the names that they would have, like Babyface Johnson or something like that. So Lucky Leon, I don't know, maybe it's a one another something to do with like the the old gangsters or or maybe a modern type gangster. Well, I was kind of hoping that maybe it would be like uh, you know one of those average Joe kind of ones, you know, like they did with the Invisible Man and Resplendent Man. Mm, but this okay. guy like has the power to like will things to happen for him, so he's like out like winning the lottery know. and all this stuff or i don't know just a thought That's you cool. know trying to make things go his way but then of course you know that kind of stuff always comes back on you and it causes that other people harm or something so i don't remember that from the show but <laughs> you never know and that's a, that's a neat idea i like it <laughs> it kind of reminds me of um what's her name over in spider-man uh, the black cat she has some kind of power to like make things go her way or something like yeah that. so that's cool i'm not sure if that's it but i'm just spitballing there yeah just from the title i'm, I'm like i don't remember anything no, about it at nothing. all I'm like, but we will find out next week because that is it for this issue of the rewatch podcast so keep up with listener interaction by liking our facebook page at facebook.com slash rewatch podcast or facebook.com slash lois and clark rewatch and follow the show on twitter at rewatch pod don't forget you can visit the web page over at rewatchpodcast.podomatic.com which has links to some of our favorite sites there such as zoomway.net the forums over there the folc.wiki.com superman homepage.com and links to our archive of film rewatch episodes. Yes, and as I've mentioned in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, we are probably going to be moving away from Podomatic at some point. It's a bit of a process changing uh, hosting services, so yeah. just keep an eye out in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. I'll, pu- I'll probably put out like a, a quick little like disclaimer episode or something like that to sort of let people know that we're going to be going ahead with a server change. Right. Forgive us while we sort of <laughs> get our feedback in order, but... Uh... We're moving on up. Just like the Jeffersons and Season's Greetings. Boom. <laughs> but uh, remember, you can always write us an email or record a voice message and send it over to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. And also, if you've enjoyed the show, please consider giving us a rate and review on iTunes. Always helps out. And you can help support the Rewatch Podcast by heading to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast where you can make a monthly contribution as little as $1. And that would very much help us with our hosting costs. Yes. It gets quite costly as you uh, put out more and more episodes. So we do appreciate any help you can give. And of course, we're up on YouTube, so search the Rewatch Podcast and subscribe today. All right, well, thank you for joining me again, Tom. Yep. And I would just say, until next time, believe it. (laughs) We gotta fly.
The Rewatch Podcast is not associated with Warner Brothers Television, ABC, Gangbuster Films Incorporated, or Round Delay Productions. Don't believe everything you see on TV. The use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in United States Code Title 17, aka Fair Use. Let's get legal on this. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Great shades of Elvis. Copyright 2016, The Rewatch Podcast. Where are your beepers? We'll be in touch. Hi, Rewatch Podcast listeners. I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. First off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch Podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this for you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So, we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them so head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast and if we get enough patrons we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support the website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast thanks everyone 